Welcome to the Good Growing Podcast. I am Chris Enroth, horticulture educator with University of Illinois Extension, coming at you from Macomb, Illinois. And we have got a great show for you today. It's uh, hostful. It's going to be Ken and I, and we're going to be talking all about Christmas trees. Um, and, you know, we're going to be diving into kind of the, the mud here when it comes to Christmas trees. And so, uh, and of course, as I mentioned, I'm not doing this by myself. I am joined, as always, by horticulture educator Ken Johnson in Jacksonville. Hey, Ken. Hello, Chris. Did you have a good Thanksgiving? It was just ducky of a Thanksgiving. That's right. Uh, well, maybe I should say just turkey, not duck. We didn't have duck. We just had turduck and turduck and <laughs> walking around the grocery store. I don't know about where whoever you're, whoever's listening or you can at your grocery store. There is this like funny thing that they call over the intercom every so often. They say turduck and turduck and turduck and, and it probably happens three times if you're there for like half an hour. So I'm just like, can we stop with the turduck and grocery <laughs> store, please? So I don't even think they sell it, but yeah. Oh goodness. So how was the Thanksgiving, Ken? It was good. It's good to see family and mm-hmm. take some time off work and back at it now. Back at it. Here we are <laughs> again. <laughs> it's no, no break is long enough. Sometimes it seems like, oh goodness. But today, Ken, we are talking about Christmas trees and, uh, sorry, I have to sneeze. Um, speaking of Christmas trees and allergies. Yeah. We're going to talk about all that stuff. So, um, the sneeze went away. But Ken, let's talk Christmas trees. Now, we were discussing before we hit record here on the show, um, we don't have real trees in our house, do we? <laughs> Unfortunately not. Used to, no. but <clears throat> that's, that's gone away. Yes, I, I grew up all my life. We would go and we would tag our Christmas tree out, usually in early November or late October sometime. You find that perfect tree, you put your tag on it, you write your name on the tag, and then you come back after Thanksgiving, they cut it down, they shake off all the, the needles and get all the squirrels out of the tree, and then you can take that home and put that in some water. Um, the, what, what kind of process uh, did you go through, Ken? Uh, so we would go, some years we would go out and cut our own um, to a bo- Boy Scout camp. And house I grew up in, we had cathedral ceilings. So we had some rather large, ugly looking trees from time to time. <laughs> um, and we would go to a, <clears throat> a lot, you know, just in the parking lot somewhere and get them. And um, this I was growing up and up until, was it last year, two years ago, when we started doing um, artificial tree, we would go to a lot mm-hmm. and pick out a tree and stuff. But due to allergies, that are not mine. We have transitioned to a fake tree. Yes. Yeah. Well, because pine trees, they do shed. Um, they shed dust. They have a lot of debris and dander and all that stuff that that just settles on them. Those are evergreens. They hold those needles for a couple years at a time, and then they have pollen. Um, and when they go from outside in the cold to inside in a warm house, sometimes. They start shedding some of that pollen, and, and, and but the dust and all the, the the dander stuff that settles on those needles can be troublesome for allergy sufferers. Not like us, though, Ken. We uh, no. long for the scent of that cut tree. <laughs> I guess there's the the uh, smelly things you can. It's not like the car stuff, but I guess it's probably similar that you can get. And I've seen them in stores where you can hang those in your tree. I don't know if I don't know if those would cause allergies to people or not, but that may be something to do. I think uh, you just gave me a great idea to decorate my my tree is to just hang those little pine tree air fresheners <laughs> on all over the tree. So it's trees decorated with trees. I, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and put some stickers on the... Uh, yes. On the ones. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You have a tertiary tree on there. That's that's right. Yes. How 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 many layers deep can we go here? It's, <laughs> it's going to be like the seven layer uh, dip uh, at the old holiday gatherings. Oh, but but Ken, you know, speaking of cut trees, um, the question that we do get asked on from time to time, uh, folks are like, well, what's the better cut Christmas tree? And I, I'll just say kind of from my experience and knowing just a little bit about Christmas trees, I know fir trees, true to their name, typically have softer needles. Um, they're a bit more pleasant when you with say a young child, like I was hanging ornaments on the tree, you're not poking yourself all the time. Um, some trees, 
some fir trees they 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 can't tolerate some of the the heavier ornaments um uh but 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 usually you can hang some heavier ornaments on fir trees now we have gotten spruce trees uh when we were growing up on a number of occasions and i do remember those very well blue spruce probably the most common one that we've gotten and why do i remember them ken why do you think what's what's the main reason why i remember my blue spruce christmas trees <laughs> perhaps those painful needles Yes, <laughs> yes, that actually would draw blood. Um, I I do recall that. So I, I remember my my dad would have to probably cut the base off and he'd have to wrestle that tree into the house and then he'd be all cut up and then I'd be decorating. I'd get all cut up. They have sharp noodles, needles. And yeah, I don't uh, think they, they retain their needles as long as like firs and pines do either. Yeah, yep. Yeah, they drop them. Um, Norway spruce is kind of that cousin to blue spruce um and they're they're kind kind of the same situation sharper needles they drop them the other thing with norway spruce is that a lot of times they're not as at least in my experience they're not as full some of those longer branches then kind of droop down a little bit so kind of a different shape of a tree but you mentioned you had all kinds of gangly looking trees in your your house growing up yeah i don't remember what kind they were i think probably had some white pines mm -hmm. and those are nice they're a little more I guess I've been airy looking to them because they have those longer needles, but those branches are really pliable, bendy. So you mm -hmm. can't, if you've got heavy ornaments, you're not going to put those on a, a white pine. That's going to be lighter ornaments and stuff. And I think those, especially if you're just going to cut in your own, those are probably going to have a lot more open bare spots. So you're going to have to strategically place your trees. You're not looking at that. Or if you've got some larger ornaments that are light filling holes and stuff. But I think a lot of times, especially when we go to lots, um, as it was a Fraser fir is what we'd usually end up getting. And those will hold their those hold their needles for a good period of time. Uh Douglas fir does too. They've got good aroma mm -hmm. uh, when you crush them. So I think those are probably two of the more popular trees, at least <laughs> when I was still purchasing trees. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this seem to be some of the more more commonly sold ones. Yeah. I I know the firs, they're also uh the Douglas and the Fraser. But also, um, when we do like wreath making and stuff, balsam fir, like, oh, the aroma, as you mentioned, just is, that's like, ah, that smells like Christmas right there. Or you do some type of, uh, some type of swag or, you know, whatever, what, however you want to uh, try to dress up anything with some, some evergreen uh, foliage, balsam fir, any of the firs, really, they have a really good aroma. So maybe not just for hanging ornaments, maybe it's just something somewhere around the house or somewhere outside the door or something. Yeah, it would be really cool. What was the one we were talking before him that smells like a skunk? Oh, Which that is, is uh, that's the Black Hill spruce. Um, I don't know if that's as common in our neck of the woods, but the the Black Hill spruce smells like uh, when you so the black, needles fall off. Black Hill yeah. or white spruce. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> They lose their needles, you vacuum them up, which kind of releases that aroma, and that aroma is skunk or cat pee scent. So not something so, maybe you want to have in your house. Not everything smells good. No, no. Unless <laughs> you like, like that kind of stuff. So who am I? It's all subjective, right? Um, so yeah, but I think uh, a lot of white pine also was in my my past as well. So I, I do recall those. My, my wife... When she was young, she had what I call the Grover tree. It was a sad fake tree that literally had almost no needles on it. It was just like these spindly green arms on it. Looked like Grover from Sesame Street. Looked like his arms just sort of dangling. And I don't know how they did it, but her and her mother every year would decorate that tree and it would look so full when they were done. They used ribbon, a lot of ornaments, a lot of lights. So, But it went from this like sad Charlie Brown tree to big full tree so it worked out so like with white pine you mentioned might be a little sparse you know be creative be clever probably fill that tree up in no time yeah we've got my my grandparents artificial tree um that we've set up in our our son's room and i think when we still were getting live trees i think it dropped more needles than the live <laughs> yes <trees. laughs> yes so that that's how it is with our 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 synthetic our fake tree that we have now it's like um we we've actually we bought one of those big bags that you can store it in just to try to keep some of that mess contained 
but we pull that out and it's just vacuuming for a few days after we set the tree up and we move it around a little because it just drops needles like crazy so um and in one day it too will look probably like the Grover tree. So, um, but yeah, we, we also have a synthetic tree. So I guess another question is Ken that we often get is people are like, well, what about sustainability? Um, those trees are made with plastics, you know, synth synthetic oils that they, they change into polymers and they create Christmas trees and all that stuff there. Um, you know, in terms of sustainability, um, you know, is there a is there a balance here, Ken? Is there anything, any advice that that we could give to people in terms of cut trees versus fake trees, and what's better for the environment? I'm gonna say it probably depends. Um, so much. <laughs> so I'd say you know, if you're going out cutting your own tree that's just out in the woods, that's probably about as sustainable as you can get. Mm -hmm. um, and there's probably not a tremendous amount of impact. You know, if you're going to a local Christmas tree farm, <clears throat> that's going to be, you know, sustainability a little, little less because they're going to be putting fertilizer in and potentially spraying and you've got the labor because they're going to be more than likely shaping that tree. So you've got the nice cone shaped tree. Uh, then if you're going to a lot where they're shipping that in from, it could be North Carolina or something like that. And then you've got all the, not only the inputs to grow it, but then to transport it. Mm -hmm. um, but then your, your artificial trees, you know, depending on how long you keep that, if you've got had that for 20, 25 years, it's probably, you know, made up for the impact, so to speak. You know, it's probably kind of leveled off compared to buying a tree. They have all these inputs every year. Mm -hmm. And there has been some investigation in this matter of real cut Christmas trees versus the synthetic trees in terms of their environmental footprints. And what Ken said is completely accurate. Basically, the longer you can hold on to that synthetic or that fake tree, the more those scales pretty much balance themselves out from an ecological standpoint. Um, yeah, there's a lot of inputs that really, there's a lot of work that goes into Christmas trees. I mean, it kind of depends on species. White pine grows somewhat quickly, but firs and sometimes spruce, they grow much more slowly, which means that's years and years of fertilizers and pesticides and labor going into creating that tree. So, you know, it's kind of that idea of inputs and kind of that what's happening after it's a Christmas tree. For our fake trees, it's going to a landfill. For the real trees, um, oftentimes, maybe it gets sent to a municipal waste place where it's shredded up into, you know, mulch or something. Uh, some people will throw it out in the backyard uh, or maybe decorate it with some bird uh, feeders or something. Or some folks I, I know might toss it into a shallow pond where fish can use it as habitat. Um, so just don't do that on anyone else's property, but your own <laughs> forewarn people, because when it comes to pumpkins on Halloween, we find pumpkins all over the place on people's property that weren't theirs. So, yeah, it was a typical Christmas tree. So we went five to seven years from when they planted mm -hmm. to when you're cutting it and buying it. Yep. Yeah. We had a really good conversation with the president of the Illinois Christmas tree association, I think. Oh, time. When was that? Last year, the year before. We could put a link to that podcast uh, in the show notes um, where, where we speak with the president of the Christmas Tree Association, and, and he goes into kind of that timeline and that labor uh, and, and that investment of basically you're speculating when you plant that Christmas tree, what is the market going to be like for live trees in seven you know, five to 10 years, depending on your species that you're, you're picking. And it just so happened in 2020, everybody wanted a live cut tree. So, so if you were investing in, uh, you know, five, seven years before 2020, it's a good investment. So yeah, you had your crystal ball, right? And you knew there was going to be a mm -hmm. pandemic and everybody wanted trees. It's exactly. And then we're going to look at you and we're going to be a little suspicious yeah, and ask you for some lottery numbers. Exactly. <laughs> uh, well, Ken, so you and I, we were both contacted uh, by a journalist with Consumer Reports, and we both kind of learned about this new thing called potted Christmas trees. Now, not new, um, but it's it's different in terms that it's a rental program. Um, could Could you just maybe just explain this a little bit help me wrap my brain around this because i'm trying to figure out 
Uh, again, we're in rural Illinois, renting a Christmas tree. How how is this being done? So my understanding is because I I am not aware of anybody anywhere near me doing this. Nope. Um, and I think when we were looking at doing some background research on it, it was mostly California, kind of the coastal areas where you have lots of people. Uh, but basically, you've got companies that'll grow some sort of evergreen Christmas tree uh, in a pot. They'll take care of it all the year, and then you can rent it for the Christmas season, return it, and they'll keep your own it, and then rent it out uh, again next year. Um, again, yeah, I don't, maybe Chicago would have something, but I don't know of anywhere, anywhere else in the state that that's doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Tree rental is kind of, kind of a new thing. And and when we were talking to the the journalist, my question was, well, what happens if you accidentally kill it? Are you liable <laughs> for, for damages? The tree doesn't survive in your care for the couple of weeks that you have it. So, uh, so this where my mind went to uh, automatically. Um, but we can link to that. That Consumer Reports article is actually out right now. And we'll also throw that link in the in the show notes uh, below. Now, they did interview a couple people. And one was Burt Craig from Michigan State University. You know, when it comes to horticulturists, notably uh, evergreens, you know, Christmas trees, things like that, Bert's probably the guy to listen to. So uh, yes, Ken and I are quoted in that article uh, and it's sound advice, I assure you, but Bert, he's the guy. <laughs> pay so, attention to him. <laughs> pay attention to him, yes. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, Ken, we, we've heard about taking a live potted evergreen that you just get at the nursery putting that, using that as a Christmas tree, right? Like that's something we've mm-hmm. experienced before. Yeah. That's not something I personally don't mean. I've, I've heard of that. And I think, again, I think it's probably a little more your more populated areas uh, where you see it, but with that, it's, you know, I'd say it's probably similar to that rental, except you're keeping it. Um, so if you're getting something like that, it's, you know, bring that, purchase it, you're going to keep it in a garage or protected area um, probably until like a week or so before Christmas or when you're going to be putting it out presumably around Christmas time. Bring that in, have it in there for a week. It's probably two weeks at the most. And then you're going to take it back outside because if you leave that inside too long, it'll break dormancy, um, start growing again. Then if you put it back outside, you've just, you're probably going to do some pretty good damage if not kill that tree. So mm-hmm. it's, it's, again, it's a, it's a short-term, um, short-term Christmas tree. Not, you wouldn't have that inside as long as you would a, a cut tree potentially. Yeah. Yeah, don't do like we do in my house and you have it up till the end of January. So uh, the <laughs> fake one. <laughs> year round. It's one benefit. <laughs> yeah, year, year round in Ken's house. <laughs> but, and the other thing, so yes, so you want to acclimatize that tree from the inside interior of the house. So that unheated garage, is a, it would be a really good uh, spot for it or maybe an unheated like sunroom or something like that. Somewhere where that tree is going to be exposed to cold temperatures kind of before and after. If you really want to plant that tree in the winter, I would suggest digging that hole now um, because the soil will hopefully freeze. We want it to freeze in the winter. It needs to. Um, and so uh, you would be pickaxing through frozen soil and we don't want to have to do that. So uh, pre-dig your hole, cover with a board or a tarp or something, and then um, re-acclimatize that tree back to the cold in the garage for a few weeks and then throw it in the hole the correct yeah, way yeah and if you're going to be holding it long term uh, make sure you protect that root ball mm-hmm. from real cold temperatures because typically that those roots are going to be in the ground so they're going to be protected somewhat from real cold temperatures we get a polar vortex or something where it's 20 below those roots are not going to be exposed to that in the ground and if it's you know outside above ground exposed to that you're going to kill a good chunk of your roots doing that yeah so a uh, kind of a few other uh thoughts on potted trees um is is going to be I and I didn't realize this until after doing a little bit of research because you know what I said to the author is that these trees get bigger and and kind of the some one of the sales tactics or techniques here is that the tree grows with your family um but trees they like to grow and they need big root systems and if if we maintained a root ball that is going to support a larger growing above ground portion of that tree well, it would take up all the living room eventually because tree roots expand horizontally. Um, now I didn't realize this, but actually after after the fact, researching this, one of the companies say that they treat their Christmas trees more like bonsai. They actually do root pruning to help keep that above ground growth 
smaller. So that was interesting to me. And so I guess that's one way to at least slow down some of that growth of those evergreens. So it, you know, just an, an interesting uh, tidbit for you. There you go. You can just do a, a bonsai Christmas tree. Well, I think that's a great idea. Speaking <laughs> of alternatives, Ken, um, it's a great segue. Uh, it's like we planned all this. Uh, <laughs> um, what about if you're not into Christmas trees? Uh, are there alternatives or is there some other option for you if you want to be like, you know what? I don't care if it's real or fake or pot in a pot. I just want something different. Do we have any alternatives to a typical evergreen? Yes, yeah, so I think too, you, you commonly see or, or, or see more commonly, particularly for, for rosemary. Um, mm -hmm. I think you're seeing it a little more during the holidays, kind of little topiaries um, of rosemary a lot of times in the shape of a, a conical evergreen or other shapes. So that would be one option. Uh, again, and you could keep that around and use that for cooking and stuff uh, if you want. It's, and it's, I would assume most people like the aroma of it, but it's got a pleasant aroma, mm -hmm. I would say, to most people. Uh, Norfolk Island pine is another one that's, I don't say we always see, but we commonly see uh, this time of year. Um, it's not actually a pine. It's in the, it's different, completely different family, the Oracoriaceae. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I pronounced that right, but I don't know if anybody knows how to pronounce it. So, <laughs> so you're right. <laughs> <laughs> but that's in the, it's, so it's native to Norfolk Island and some other islands in the South Pacific. Um, so as you can imagine, it's kind of like warmer, uh, more humid conditions. So that's not, but you can buy that uh, this time of year, often decorated um, with ornaments and stuff. A lot of the ones that I've seen, a lot of times are spray painted green. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you, if you buy one, make sure there's not spray painted. If it is, try to get that paint off of there because that's going to block any photosynthesis from happening, which will eventually lead to the decline of your plant. Um, and because they are uh, more of a tropical tree they, and they do like more humid conditions, one of the issues people have with that is that for homes during the winter, you're typically pretty low humidity. Uh, so putting that with a, a bunch of plants running a humidifier near it, they do best with 50% plus humidity, which I don't know about you, but my home is never anywhere near that uh, during Not the winter. Not in the winter time, at least, no. <laughs> So, so, and that's when, you know, especially when the trees get larger, uh, people put lights on them and, and again, lighter ornaments, they're not, branches aren't terribly stiff, um, but you could do that and then treat it like a house plant, move it outside uh, in the winter or in the late spring, summer, once the, once we're in the fifties and stuff, and then bring it back in in the fall and use that again for your, your Christmas tree. And it will uh -huh. grow with your family. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Until it gets too tall, it's <laughs> touching your ceiling. And then you say, what do I do with this tree? It's so <laughs> tall. I don't know what to do with it. And eh, just throw it away. Or take, just chop it off, chop the top off. Yeah. And I think, I think when people are growing them, they get rather uh, lanky because we don't yep. typically give them enough light in the house. So again, west or south facing exposure. If you can give them some supplemental lighting, grow lights, something like that, that'll help you keep it a little more compact growth and the um, in the wild these trees get huge like they're pretty massive yeah what was it um 200 uh plus feet tall with 10 foot trunks so well that fit in your <laughs> cathedral ceilings <again. laughs> so so if you want to grow one of these full size go move to south florida or hawaii there you go mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. otherwise you're not going to see a full grown in Illinois. yep yeah oh. Uh, another thing, just kind of mentioning as we're talking live plants, whether it's potted rosemaries uh, or, or what, is the lights that we put on them. Um, so your your regular um, the incandescent lights, those put off a lot of heat. The nice thing about the LED strands is they don't put off as much heat, which could dry out uh, foliage quicker. So uh, if you are doing live plants, as we're we're talking about right now. LED string lights, probably going to be the better one to use with those. And if you are, if you do still have incandescent lights, you know, make sure you turn those off when you're not home. And mm -hmm. I would probably just leave them on when you're in the room and then off. Just, yeah. So I guess you're not drying stuff out. And yeah, we've all seen those fire uh, videos, <laughs> yeah. uh, holiday uh, fire videos where how quickly actually a, a tree will go up. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, check, check your uh, cords and make sure nothing's frayed and, and all of that. Don't let them catch you on them. Mm -hmm. Safety PSA here. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, Kent, is there another, uh, there's kind of this interesting one that that you had mentioned before the show in terms of live plant that I, I have heard about this, but what, what's like this other alternative that that people are also using? It's another one I've heard of. And I think I remember my, my dad growing up had a friend, they would use a, an orange tree, a mm-hmm. citrus tree. Um, and, and December is when citrus is, is ripening and pick me and picked. So you can have a, you know, an orange tree with some oranges on it um, and use that. And then they will bloom I don't know, in January, February timeframe, at least in Florida, if I remember right. Um, and if you've never smelled a citrus bloom, I'd say that's up there with some of the, the nicest smelling stuff out there. So that would be another alternative. Um, orange, some some sort of citrus. Um, again, you've got that evergreen and again, treat it like a, like a house plant, lots of light. Take it out in the summer and bring it back in. Yeah. Oranges have a, a significance, I think, especially with older generations. Um, it was it was quite a treat to get an orange in December when you lived in the northern U.S. or Canada. So oranges. I remember my my mother in law. She talked about as a kid one of the nicest presents she could get would have been an orange and some chocolate because those were things that you didn't were not as readily available, especially oranges in in the winter months. So that means like someone took a lot of time and effort to get those oranges from Florida, truck them all the way through Southern US, Midwest, up into the Northern parts of the state here, um, try to keep them from freezing, which back in the fifties and sixties, that was a lot of work. Mm-hmm. So even as a kid, we would, from, from my dad's side, we would get oranges in our stocking because <laughs> his kids were like, what, I don't want this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my kids wouldn't get it anymore. They'd be like, Dad, we got oranges on the counter in the kitchen. What, what, why am I getting oranges in my stockings? Like, yeah, they're they're pretty plentiful these days. So, Well, Ken, I guess as we wrap up the discussion on Christmas trees and, you know, whether you're doing a Christmas tree or some other version of a live plant, do we have to watch out for other things that might pop up? or spring out of the tree. Uh, the, any creepy well, crawlies creepy that we need crawlies. to keep an eye on. Yeah. Uh, so I've, I've never had the the fortune of having this happen. I've always <laughs> wish I <Fortune>. did. <laughs> <laughs> but I've heard of, you know, praying mantids laying, having their, their oothica in there. Mm-hmm. So you, you, know, you bring that inside, it's warmed up and then you've got hundreds of, or dozens of baby praying mantids running around. Um, mm-hmm. I guess I'll never have that happen now. There were artificial trees, but and you can have stuff like spiders or then maybe aphids or or other things living on those live trees. And when you bring them inside, you know, everything warms up and they become active again. I would say vast majority of them, I can't really think of anything that would be an issue. Um, you know, once they're inside, it's, again, our houses are real dry this time of year. They're not going to last a terribly long time. They're going to be just, they're going to be a nuisance. So if they're really bothering you, vacuum them up, sweep them up, toss them outside and you won't have to worry about it. And even if it was like a wood boring insect, you know, bring in firewood mm-hmm. again the wood in our house um, or in our furniture is so dry those things that that we have here in illinois aren't going to to be able to survive on that yeah and don't 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 spray your firewood don't do any of that stuff uh, or your for your tree <laughs> or your tree especially if it's a cut tree because it's dead <laughs> don't worry about trying to save it with the pesticide um uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah, all good advice. This is a lot of good information about Christmas trees. Hopefully, uh, folks, um, you know, whether you celebrate Christmas or not, uh, I know a lot of folks who don't, but they still put up a tree. Uh, it's good advice for everybody, hopefully, uh, if you like having a little bit of greenery around this time of year, which I think we all could use, you know, putting, bringing landscape plants into the house, and then putting lights on the outside of the house. Um which is Jim Gaffigan say is like the behavior of a drunk man, but uh, yeah, <laughs> but yeah, that's what we do uh, in December. So uh, Ken, thank you so much for uh, such a, a well-rounded conversation on, on Christmas trees. Thank you too. Let's, uh, let's do this again next week. Oh, we shall do this again next week. It's going to be a garden bite. I'll be back chatting about, oh, whatever topic I feel like chatting about. So uh, we'll be excited to to get back into it then next week. And so listeners, thank you for what you do best, and that is listening, or if you're watching us on YouTube, watching. And as always, keep on growing.